Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Welcome to Sunday morning. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we have started a new series. We're about three weeks into it, and we've been looking at the seven woes of the religious leaders. Now, this was something that Jesus uh, taught and uh, something he spoke out against. Uh, particularly against the Pharisees. These were the people that were the religious leaders of Jesus' day. These were the holy rollers, right? Last week we read in Matthew 23, 3, do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. Jesus is going to make the argument that these leaders have failed their community, that they're not good community leaders. They're not people that we should be looking up to and idolizing, and they're certainly not people that we should be following. They've failed their communities. They've failed their roles as spiritual teachers, and they aren't the good guys that everyone thinks that they are. Well, and you could say, well, that's great, but there's no Pharisees today. Eh, that's true. I think while they may not be around, though, Sure, the Pharisees, these ancient teachers, they've passed away, they've died. Their teaching, though, lives on. And most of the time, I think, what's actually worse is, even though they're gone, we still listen, we still even believe, we still even teach and reinforce some of the things that they did and taught. So I want to look at the seven woes over these coming weeks and do like how we do with all of Jesus' teachings. We ask, what did it mean for the people back then? What did it mean for them to listen to it? And then, what does it mean for us? And we're going to look at two different passages that both address this same topic. Luke chapter 11, verse 37. While Jesus was speaking, a Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools! Did not he who make the outside of the cup make the inside also? But give as alms those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. All right, so what's happening? There's something about cups and washing hands and the Pharisees are upset and Jesus seems to be even more upset. Well, the religious leaders have invited Jesus over for a meal, over for dinner, right? And obviously they want to talk. They probably also want to scope him out because with them there's always some ulterior motive. But Jesus isn't going to just blindly walk into a trap. He knows what's going on. And so back then there was this belief, there was this practice, there was this ritual that everyone was doing. There's this little cup washing ritual. You wash the outside of the cup, you pray, you wash the inside of the cup, you pray, you wash your hands while you sing happy birthday, and then you serve yourself food, you sit down to eat. Jesus doesn't do any of that. He just grabs a cup, grabs some food, sits down to eat, and everybody watching says, well, I declare, right? They all, they, they, they all say, well, I never, right? Doesn't he know? Luke says, they're astonished, right? They're beside themselves, they're appalled, they're aghast, right? Here's what I love. Jesus sees their indignation but he doesn't wait for them to say anything. Jesus speaks first, and he says, I know what you do, but it's a wasted practice. He says, you are all fools. He calls them fools. Can I ask you something? Why do you think the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus? I mean, come on, it doesn't make any sense, right? Here's this young, very popular rabbi. They've invited him over for a nice meal. He doesn't wash his hands. He doesn't wash his plate. 
He doesn't even say a prayer before eating. He just begins eating like some common peasant without any regard and then without any provocation, he looks up at all of the people who've invited him and then he just starts chewing them out. Well, maybe Luke records this story too harshly. Maybe that's not exactly the way it went down. You know, this story is also recorded over in Matthew. We could read that. We'll read that and we'll see if it's just a little softer, maybe a little bit more subtle, a little more sweet, a little more the Jesus we're familiar with. Because I can't believe Jesus would talk this way to religious people, especially people who'd invited him over for dinner. Let's see what Matthew says. Matthew 23, verse 25. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites! For you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate, that the outside also may be clean. See, that's not so bad. I mean, Luke calls them fools, but Matthew only calls them blind. So, yeah, Luke says they're full of greed and wickedness, but Matthew says they were greedy and self-indulgent. So that's a little better, right? No. Actually, Jesus knew exactly where these men stood on the issues. And it wasn't uncommon to see people in religion stand on both sides and disagree. In the days of Jesus, people were very passionate about debate. They would take some small, insignificant thing, and maybe it was a rule, maybe it was some widely held belief, and they would just split it right down the middle. In those days, people stood on one side or the other, and they were very passionate with each other. Nobody seemed interested in meeting in the middle, maybe to shake hands and work together. Those people were so backwards. I'm so glad that we are not like that anymore. So why are we here? How do we get to the point where there's all this washing and praying? Why were the Pharisees so concerned about this? Why are they mad at Jesus? Well, their rules all come from the Old Testament, right? And they counted up all the rules one day, and they came up with 613. And they call them the mitzvot, 613 laws. Rules like Genesis 9.3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. And as I give you the green plants, I give you everything. Genesis 129. God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. Leviticus 17.15 says, When any person eats an animal which dies or is torn by beasts, whether he is a native or an alien, he shall wash his clothes, bathe in water, and remain unclean until evening, and then he becomes clean. And all these laws reinforce eating and what you can eat, how you can eat it, how it's prepared, because for the Jew, for the follower of God, they believe that this is all connected. Everything's connected. Everything is sacred. All of life is spiritual, especially food. I mean, there's no compartments. There's no segments to life. Your life is not broken down into tiny little pieces or tiny little boxes. Nobody would ask you, so how is married life? Married life? It's just life, right? Nobody would say, hey, how are things at work? Hey, how is your walk with God? As if to imply that all those things are separate parts of you. For the Hebrew, they are all the same. For the Jew, it was just life. It's just life. It's holistic. It's all connected. We should be living the undivided life. And that's what Jesus is concerned about. And this especially includes food. I mean, the meal is a place where it all comes together, where you see just how connected everything is and how sacred it is. Food and preparing food and eating food is very circular, right? It's very holistic. Food comes from the earth. 
and it sustains you. In, in an agricultural society like where Jesus is living and how he's growing up, Jesus would have had a very Mediterranean diet. He would have eaten food like kale and pine nuts and dates and olive oil and lentils and soups. And for protein, they would have had baked fish every now and again. So just the idea of food and how they get food is really very spiritual when you think about it. You drop a seed, you bury it, right? You cover it with earth and then you water it and then it grows out of the earth and then you have food and then the food goes into you and it sustains you, it gives you life. It's a very holy thing. It's a very spiritual thing. Food reminds us that God provides and that God takes care of us. Food is sacred. So that would mean eating can become worship. So the Pharisees wanted to respect every part of this. Well, if it's worship, then every part of this should be sacred. That means it's not just in the eating of the food that's holy, but then every aspect of the food is holy. It should go all the way down to how food is prepared and how we eat. So they made all these rules. They made rules on top of rules, and they call it Talmud. Talmud covers how you store food, how you prepare food, how you eat, the prayers that you say, how you clean the cup before you eat, how you clean the cup after you eat. This is now what Jesus is walking into. Not a divide on scripture, not, not an argument about how you interpret mitzvot, but how you divide religious ritual. Uh, uh, where do you stand on this Talmud? And it was all added. It was all added on top of the meal, layer upon layer. Jesus cuts through all that ritual and he asks, what about truth? Yeah, I see your ritual. What about truth? What about the reasons why we do these things? Not the rules, the reasons why. What's more important, Jesus asks. Because truth should always be what's more important, right? Obedience should always be what's more important. But sadly, what happens so often with truth and with beauty, those things get lost in rules and regulations. It gets lost. And pretty soon, we care more about the rules and we care more about the regulations than the reasons why we have those rules. One group said, if you clean the outside of the cup, it's clean. One group said, no, 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 no. If you clean the inside of the cup, it's clean. Another group said, no, 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 no. If you wash your hands, you're clean. And Jesus, rebel that he is, just grabs a cup off the counter. He doesn't wash it. He doesn't wash his hands. He just sits down and eats. Now, does this mean that Jesus cares less about hygiene and health than the Pharisees? No, of course not. But he also knows that the religious leaders don't care about hygiene and health either. They're just rule followers. In fact, they've forgotten why they follow the rules. Jesus isn't trying to teach them a lesson about health or hygiene or about why we wash cups and bowls or why we wash our hands. Instead, Jesus is trying to teach them about obedience and about knowing what's on God's heart and knowing what God wants. Jesus says you do all these things because you think that's what God wants. But in following the letter of the law, you have forgotten the truth. The law of the Pharisees said someone had to wash their hands before a meal and in between courses. And every detail was laid out. They would have these large stone pots that were kept for water just to make sure the water stayed clean and didn't cross contaminate. And the rules were so precise that the Pharisees had even figured out the exact amount of water that was to be used to wash your hands and to wash a cup. And they would measure the water out with empty eggshells as measuring cups. 
First the water had to be poured over your hands and it would begin at the tips of your fingers and it would run down your wrists like a doctor. And then the second part was they would wash the palms of their hands and they would do that by rubbing their palms together like this. And then the third part was that they would wash this part of their hands and then turn their hands this way and let the water run off their fingertips. So first front to back, then palms, then back to front. Were any of these instructions in the Bible? No. They were just man-made rules. So Jesus sits down with the Pharisees, and he doesn't do any of their ritual washing. Not outside, not inside. Jesus just flat out rejects their rules. And then he doesn't defend himself. He just turns it back on them and he says, I know what you're thinking. I know you're appalled at my actions. And he, and he, and he says, you know, you, you, you think that I'm embarrassing or that woe to me. And he says, I say, no, woe to you. He says, this isn't about me, it's about you. Woe to you. you. You make all of this effort to clean the cup. And Jesus says, but your soul, Jesus says, your soul is greedy. Your soul is wicked. Your soul is self-indulgent. Your soul is self-obsessed. Your soul is concerned with what it looks like on the outside, and you give no attention to who you are on the inside. Jesus says, you think you're clean? <laughs> you're not clean. Jesus says, you're filthy in God's eyes. And Jesus says, the reason why you can't see it is because you're blind. And the reason why you don't know you're wrong is because you're fools. Tell me something. How can leaders lead if they're blind? How can leaders lead and be respected and trusted if they're fools? Jesus calls them hypocrites. What's a hypocrite? Well, hypo means under, right? And crite is the word for fake. So it's an underneath, under, the, under phony, right? It, it, this would be someone who is pretending, somebody who's an, an actor. Hypocrite is a word you'd use in Greek theater for someone who wears a mask. They are the, they're two-faced, right? They're acting. Jesus also calls them self-indulgent. Self-indulgent means that they have no strength. They, they, as somebody who can't control their actions, they can't control their appetite. People, they have longings and they have self-destructive habits and they can't control them. Jesus also calls them wicked, calls them evil. Why'd they want to kill him? <laughs> and you think those would all be the worst things, but those aren't the worst things. The worst thing Jesus calls them is fools. That's the worst thing. Jesus calls them fools. Fools is the Greek word ephrons. Ephrons means without understanding. You don't understand. Jesus teaches them about this not understanding somewhere else. Actually, in Mark chapter 2. Because it seems the Pharisees were constantly making up these rules where rules didn't need to be, and they were forgetting, right? They were being foolish. They were forgetting the important stuff. They thought they were focusing on what was right, but they weren't. They had forgotten all of the reasons they had the rules. Take the Sabbath, for instance. Jesus was always working on the Sabbath. And it's not a little tiny, small side rule. This is one of the Ten Commandments, right? This isn't one of the little ones. This is one of the big ones. When Jesus decides to do something, he does it big, right? Go big or go home. He, so he looks for the biggest rule in the book. The one rule that's going to make all of them mad. And the Bible writers always let you know when Jesus is doing something on the Sabbath. But come on. I mean, let's, let's be real for a second. Let's really think about this. Do we honestly believe that the Son of God would break one of the Ten Commandments. Jesus is also a rabbi. He's also a community leader. He's also a religious leader. He's also somebody that people look up to and, and who teaches. Would Jesus 
willfully break one of the Ten Commandments? Do we think that he actually broke the law? Of course not, right? He didn't do that. Instead, Jesus is, again, breaking the man-made amendments to the rules. And Jesus always had to stop and, and set these religious leaders straight. Mark chapter 2, verse 23 says, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abathar the high priest and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Okay, Jesus is supposedly breaking some rules here. He and his disciples are walking through a field, and they're plucking heads of grain. And the Pharisees say, That's work. You know, you're working on the Sabbath, and you're harvesting. Harvesting? Yeah, you, you can't harvest either, right? Because harvesting would be work. Deuteronomy 23 says, If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. Legitimate verse, legitimate rule to follow, don't harvest, right? But is that what Jesus is doing? Is he reaping right now? Is he harvesting? He's just picking a few heads of grain. He doesn't have a sickle. So it becomes this argument about what work is and what harvesting is and, and how the Sabbath fits into all of this. Just like washing the cup, just like washing the hands, there's this rule about what is considered right. The Pharisees interpret picking a few heads of grain as reaping. But come on! I mean, they're making a mountain out of a molehill. This is like them saying, you opening peanut shells at Texas Roadhouse is cooking, right? But this is what makes legalism legalistic. As usual, the Pharisees have gone overboard with quantifiers and restrictions. There were some Pharisees who even had classified 39 different types of work that you weren't allowed to do on the Sabbath. So how does Jesus respond? He responds with the Bible. He responds with scripture. He asks them, have you never read the Bible? Which is really another way of calling them fools, right? He says, have you, had, have you never read the story about King David and what King David did? You know, he was in need, he was hungry, and then how he helped even the, the men that were with him. Have you not read that story? In other words, you know, you guys, you love King David so much. Have you forgotten his stories? That, that's a huge first century burn from Jesus. So Jesus proceeds to tell them the story as if they don't already know. He says, okay, okay, fellas, you know, it's, it's Bible story time. Everybody listen. And Jesus says, Saul was the Lord's anointed. And then... It was David. But first, Saul pursued David. And David was on the run. And David got tired. David breaks into a temple and he asks the priest for food. He says, do you have any bread? And the priest says, all I have is holy bread. This is bread that was offered to God as sacrifice. And only the priests were allowed to eat it. David took the bread and he ate it. And he gave some of that bread to his men. What was Jesus' point? Human need takes precedence over holy bread. Human need takes precedence over ceremonial law. In both situations, Jesus and David, a godly man did something that was supposedly forbidden. And so Jesus says to the Pharisees, if David could do it, then I can do it. Because what should, the, what should the priest in David's story have done? Just turn David away? 
turn those hungry men away and say, well, I have all this food, but you know, I can't give it to you. In other words, be legalistic. No, he, he wasn't legalistic. He was grace-filled. Legalism always stifles grace. And therein lies the truth that Jesus is trying to teach them. The line in the sand between Jesus and the religious leaders they wanted to follow rules, and Jesus wanted to follow love, wanted to follow mercy. Jesus always chooses grace. The Pharisees think that they're obeying. They think they're the right ones, that they're the obedient ones. They're the good Sabbath observers. But Jesus teaches them, no, 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 because you've missed the point. And you always miss the point, he says. The Sabbath is for your benefit. The Sabbath is for man's benefit. The Sabbath is for you to rest. It's for you to worship. It's for you to find joy. And if you are starving, the Sabbath isn't working. The rules and the regulations have become so burdensome, Jesus said, now you serve the rules. You're not serving God. You're just obeying rules. You're not obeying God. It all got turned around. Legalism always misses the point. Jesus knew that a human need takes precedence. Jesus says, I'm a God who came to break down all these legalistic rules and I've come to meet your need to meet you where you are. What about you and me? What about us? We can do it too, right? We can do it too. We can become too legalistic and we can become too hung up on being a rule follower that we forget to show grace, that we forget to show love. But we can also learn to be like Jesus and we can pick love up and we can leave legalism behind. We can leave legalism behind. It's just like coming to church. You know, right now, I am preaching to empty seats. None of us are at church right now. And it makes us feel guilty. It makes us feel like we are being disobedient. It makes us feel like we're doing something wrong. And I feel it too. I do. I feel wrong. I feel like a bad pastor. I feel like someone who has let everybody else down by closing the doors. A church should be open. A church should be open. But, you know, the Sabbath was made for you. It was made for you and not the other way around. Just like washing the cup. We wash the cup to keep ourselves healthy. We wash our hands to keep ourselves healthy. But the Pharisees had made it about legalism. And it was never supposed to be about that. We can leave legalism behind. Your relationship with God does not depend on church attendance. Attending church every week does not make you a better Christian. And it doesn't make you more of a Christian. When the Pharisees become angry and indignant, they say, well, I just don't understand you, Jesus. You know, why, why are you doing it this way? Because this isn't how we've ever done it before. This isn't how it should be done. And Jesus responds with mercy. Jesus makes a stand on principle, and he says, you know what? It's about mercy over tradition. Jesus made that ultimate choice with his own life. Jesus gave his life. Jesus chose mercy over his own life. All of these things that Jesus does and says gets him killed. Because Jesus wasn't just fighting legalism and he wasn't just fighting ignorance. He was fighting a system. He was fighting a system that told people that they had to behave or God wouldn't love them. 
I know you didn't go to church today. Guess what? <laughs> I didn't either. But God still loves us. He's not mad at us. As followers of Jesus, we need to take the mask of hypocrisy off and leave legalism behind. I feel we've got to be people who make room for mercy. We need to make room for mercy. We need to see beyond the rules, see beyond the regulations that we make up. And we've got to start digging deep into people's hearts. If you hear a baby cry repeatedly in church, what's your first response? What's your first thought? Is it critical or is it merciful? We found out that several of the amenities in Walden were shutting down, the pool, the yacht club, shutting down for health reasons. And what was the outcry? Was it critical or merciful? What about people walking around wearing masks? People walking around without wearing masks. Are we critical or merciful? Family, we need to leave hypocrisy behind. We need to leave legalism on the ground and we need to run towards mercy. We need to be people of love and grace. Tell me if this story in Matthew 9 doesn't sound familiar. As Jesus reclined at a table in a house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were also reclining with Jesus and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? There were dirty cups. And now we've shifted to dirty people. Those people. Them. But when Jesus heard it, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. Jesus says it to them again. He says, hey, it sounds like you guys don't know your Bible stories. It sounds like you guys don't know your Old Testament. Tell you what, I've got homework for you. I want you to go home and I want you to study this verse. He's calling them fools again. I have no idea why they wanted to kill him. Go home. You do, do some homework. The verse is, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, for I came not to call the righteous but sinners. What does God want? Does God want legalistic rule followers? It's hard to be legalistic, isn't it? I think it's more, I think it's more hard to make sure that I follow every rule and to make sure that everyone else follows every rule. When, when I do that, some of them are going to fall through the cracks and I'm going to forget one of those rules. And when I profess to be a rule follower but forget a rule, then I become a hypocrite. God says, I desire mercy not sacrifice. In other words, you Pharisees want to look one way. You want to look like a clean cup on the outside, but that's not a reflection of who you really are. You're trying to make sure that everyone follows the rules, but you forget some of them and you disobey some of them. You yourselves break the rules. And then you argue about what's best, about how to be clean, the inside or the outside, Jesus says, why are you arguing about the outside of the cup or the inside of the cup? Can't you see that it's one cup? It is a cup. There is no inside outside. It, it is a cup, just like you. You're a person. There's no inside outside. There's, there's no spiritual life, married life, work life, home life. You are, you are a person. You are a holistic person. Don't live a segmented life. Don't live a divided life. Jesus wants you to live an undivided life where spirituality and prayer and scripture and God seep into every single part of your life. You're not only a Christian when you're here at church because right now you're not at church and you're still a Christian. The Pharisees were divided and they lived in this culture that said it's all about what people see. Good thing things have changed. 
As long as it looks right on the outside, you're okay. It's just like wearing a mask. It's an image that you're projecting. It's an image that you want everyone to see, but in, inwardly, on the inside, you're a different person. Let me tell you something, people have been wearing masks since long before 2020. We all hide things that we don't want people to see, don't we? Sooner or later though, I think you get tired of wearing a mask and you say, I don't want to pretend anymore. I just want to be real. Can I just be real? I mean, can I just make a mistake and admit it? Can I just walk around and just admit openly that I'm not perfect? I'm tired of trying to keep up appearances. Can I just post pictures of my real kids and my real house and not care what all the other Facebook moms think? I'm tired of living my life in a beauty filter. Just want to be me. These are my real kids. This is my real house. This is my real life. This is my real me, church. Fault and all. This is who I am. I want to just be this weight and this shape and this size and be okay. Can I just flat out admit that I am a broken person, I am a sinner, and I'll just stop wearing this mask and stop pretending and stop being a hypocrite? Of course you can. Of course you can. You can do that. That's the good news of Jesus. The good news is once you take the mask off and you start being real and honest about your life, real and honest about your flaws, see, that's the key. Saying that your flaws aren't there or that you've got it made on the outside, that's hypocrisy, right? But it's when you remove that mask, you start becoming more merciful you start becoming more loving because you're aware of how much mercy and love you need. And so you start giving it out. 1 John 4, 29 says, we love because he first loved us. We need that love. We need that mercy. We need that grace. And when we're so aware of it, and we recognize and we flat out admit, I'm an imperfect person and I'm broken. And then you realize how much grace you need and how much grace comes your way that is undeserved. Then you start becoming a less critical, less legalistic, more loving, more grace-filled person. Not a, not a grace-filled person on Sunday. All the time that we are open and raw, we take that mask of hypocrisy off, I break those chains of legalism, and then I become free. In all the areas of my life, I live an undivided life. I live the life that Jesus would want. Let's pray. Dear Lord, right now, to teach to an empty church is not, it's not what I signed up for. It's not what any of us signed up for. To watch church on YouTube just seems so wrong and all the bells are going off and we're saying this is not how it should be. Nothing is how it should be right now. The world is upside down. Remind us that we are the church even though we are not in a building. We are your ministers. We are your spirit-filled ambassadors every single day. Lord, I don't want my life to be segmented. I don't want my life to be compartmentalized. I don't want to be a Christian on Sunday. I want to be your follower every day. Help me to take off the mask of legalism, the mask of hypocrisy. Help me to live an undivided life a life that pursues you in every walk. I want you and your words to seep into every corner and empty space of my life. 
and I want to walk with you every single day. And Lord, as I become more real and more open and more vulnerable with my brothers and sisters about who I am and the hurts that I really have, the fears and the anxieties that I really have, I pray that that makes me more merciful and more loving to others, to my neighbor. I don't want to be a critical person. I don't want to be a person that points fingers and accuses and condemns. Help me to be more like your son. I want to be more loving and more grace-filled. I want to be a person who shows mercy because that's what you desire. Lord, I need more grace because I am a, I am a broken person. I need more forgiveness because I am a sinner. And I need more love because there are times when I feel unloving. Lord, we need your gentle hand. We also need your healing hand. This world is divided and it needs to be drawn together. Our country is divided and it needs to be drawn together. Our country is sick. This world is sick and it needs to be healed. And healing comes from you. Unity comes from you. Love and grace come from you. So may we come to you. The answer doesn't lie in any of the things that we are doing. The answer lies in getting on our knees and admitting that we are powerless and admitting that we need you, because we do. Be with us now. Be with us this week as we go from this place and remember that we are your church no matter where we meet or where we worship. And you are our Father. And you are our God. We thank you for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for spending this time with me. And just a reminder, you can like this video. You can also subscribe to our channel so that you're alerted when more videos get posted. We're also doing a Bible study on YouTube where going through the book of Revelation piece by piece, maybe a little 10-minute segment. So make sure that you are getting that if that's something that would help you or just give you a little bit more love, a little bit more Bible in your life. Uh, feel free to post this link to your own wall to share the love of Walden Church with your friends and neighbors. And I will see you guys very soon. I love you. Have a great week.